And then there's dualism. There are two equal gods. One is good and the other is evil. Well, I totally disagree with that because nobody's equal with God. Nobody's equal. God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient. He knows everything and he's omnipotent, all-powerful. And there is no one greater than God. And then you have the deism which God created the universe and then left it to run by itself. God doesn't interfere in the world. It's as if God wound the clock and then let it run by itself. Well, I totally disagree with that. Uh, Because if you were to have a baby, do you just leave the baby to raise itself? You don't. So how's he going to create something to just leave it to run itself? We have a very intelligent God. (laughs) So no, I don't agree with that. And then our last one is theism or monotheism, which is there one true God exists. He is a personal being who rules over his universe. Now that one I agree with because there is only one true and living God and that's God the Father. And he does, he is in full control. He created the heavens and the earth. So we know that there's one existing God. So now there's arguments of God's existence. And so here in this study, we're going to give you supportive arguments. If someone you come across and they want to understand why God exists, here we're going to give you some supporting arguments of knowing that God exists. So over the years, great thinkers have used a number of logical arguments to point us toward a belief in God's existence. It is important for us to be familiar with their best arguments. But we know God exists because in our faith we stand and believe God is real. So the first argument is cosmological argument. This argument says that for every effect, there is a cause greater than the effect. So imagine a set of dominoes. Um, If you've ever seen a domino display where you have the one dominoes and then you have the dominoes lined all behind and there's some that will line dominoes up to an entire room outside of the room doing different tricks. So the cause is that if you knock one, the first domino over, the effect is it's going to knock every single domino off. So the cause and effect. So the question is, how would you use this point to argue for the existence of God? Well, the cause was God spoke, and the effect was everything was. (laughs) God spoke it into existence, and it was. So in Genesis, if you would turn with me, I also have handouts with all the supporting scriptures. If you could follow along with the supporting scriptures, If you don't have one, um, our own Deacon Joe has copies. So he does, I have the supported scriptures already typed out for you so you can read along with me. And the first one I'm reading is Genesis 1 and 3. And it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. So there's your cause and effect. He spoke it into existence. God said, let there be light. The effect was, and there was light. Genesis 1 and 6 says, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called firmament heaven, and evening and the morning were the second day. And then in Genesis 1 and 9, it says, and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters was called his seas. And God saw that it was good. So this demonstrates that God spoke it into existence, that cause, and then the effect is that it was. Or it is. (laughs) So the next argument is a teleological argument. 
Now, this is the argument from design. In some ways, it is similar to the cosmological argument, but it says that because of the great evidence of order and design in the universe, there must be an intelligent being who planned it all. So then the question, what are some of the evidence of the design in nature? So if you've ever studied or watched or seen for yourself patterns in nature, there are visible regularities of forms found in nature itself. Um, if you look at the patterns, you can sometimes see mathematical models. You can see symmetries, trees, spirals, waves, um, cracks, and stripes. Take, for instance, a pattern of a leopard. If you ever looked at the leopard or if you've seen it on uh, um, a book or on Google, the patterns of the, the leopard is unique spot colored patterns, very unique. Then if you look at the patterns of a tree stump, you cut open a tree stump and it's in a spiral, very much a pattern, very much a design. If you, if you look at the a pattern of a leaf, the leaf looks like veins. If you look at your own veins, you'll see the, the root and you'll see it just spiraling out like veins. And then what is amazing to me is the pattern of a snowflake. If you've ever looked, you know, um, scientists even have pictures on, on, uh, in Google. They have very much a hexagonal shape. If you look very closely, now we know with the naked eye, you can't see a snowflake shape. <laughs> it's coming down from the sky, you know, falls on the ground. But very closely, um, they've taken pictures of it, and all of them have very unique shapes. So this is all a part of the design. It had to be an intelligent God to have these patterns and these designs. Um, so what are some evidence of orderliness? Of orderliness is day and night. We have day and we have night. We have seasons. We have the rotation of the earth that causes the seasons. We have growth patterns of humans and animals. You know, nobody births a grown man or a grown woman. <laughs> uh, neither do animals birth. They all start from a growth age and they begin to grow because it's orderly. This is all designed by a very intellectual uh, being, which we know is God. Could this have happened by mere chance, some think? Absolutely not. Some say, bang, you know, with all the coordination, all the patterns I just described, all the uniqueness and the orderliness, it has to be somebody intelligent behind all of this. <laughs> has to be somebody intelligent. So I take, for instance, my daughter, Elizabeth. I'm going to use her as an example. You know, she, we very early on found her t artistic talent. When she was in kindergarten, the teacher would say, oh, I could tell what she's drawing is very, I understand what she's drawing. If she drew a flower, she knew what it was. If she drew a cat, she knew what it was. You know, mo and so we identified her artistic talent. But definitely, her, her drawing at the age of five is different, definitely different from her drawing now. But that came with experience, intelligence. It came with all of the knowledge that she has. So surely by mere happenings, this is not why the earth exists. It's got to be an intelligent being, very intelligent, very strategic, very knowledgeable, that would have created the, the um, heavens and the earth and the different things I just described. So these are good existence that God exists. Don't you agree? <laughs> I would agree. All right. I'm going to pause. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Nope. Okay. So, could it have happened in any other way apart from the plan of a personal and intelligent God? So, a supporting scripture, Genesis 1 and 12, says, And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So even our, order, even, you know, planting a seed, growing apples or corn or whatever it is, still very much a pattern and orderliness of God to provide for us to eat. Don't you agree? It couldn't just happen. But he made that and he had that in his plan. Genesis 1 and 14 says, And God said, 
Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So here's your orderliness again, that you're able to keep track. This is the season. This is the plan. This is the orderliness that God has put in place. So this, again, proves that, yes, God exists, and he is very much an intelligent being. So the next argument is anthropological argument, and the Greek word for man is anthropos. anthropos. This is really the argument from man himself. This argument takes a, a look at man and what he's like and determines that because he is the way he is. There must have been a God who made him. It takes note of the following factors. There seems to be a universal ideal of God, but even in the most remote regions, people have a sense and a need to worship or appease some being who is greater than themselves. You know, some may not be worshiping the true and living God, but they still have that sense of, I need to worship something greater than myself. Men have a moral consciousness. They have a sense of right and wrong, apart from some supreme being who himself is sourced of ethical standards. How could we have a sense of right and wrong? Some say that your culture and environment develop your sense of right and wrong in you. But of course, these things shape our consciousness. But then the question remains, where do our consciousness originate? So we do have that sense of knowing what is right and what is wrong. Despite today's time where people are saying everything goes, people still have a sense of we know that murder is wrong. <laughs> we still have that sense of what is right and what is wrong. So men are personal beings, and they have intellect, emotion, and will. So how do men get these if there is no God with intellect, emotion, and will? Okay, here's another supporting scripture. Genesis 1 and 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth among, upon the earth. So there goes that orderliness again. Here, you know, you have people that uh, take care of the fish in the sea, even to right now. You have people that take care of the cattle. We know farmers do that. Um, people who take care of the earth. Um, and everything they are accountable for, God ordained that to us. So here is another reason that we were made in his image. Genesis 1 and 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So we were created in the likeness of God. We have intellect um, emotion and will, just like God does, just like God does. So the next argument is ontological argument. This argument says that because man has an idea of an absolutely perfect being, such a being must exist. This is true because if a perfect being were only an idea and not reality, then of course it would be no longer a perfect being because existence is a part of its perfection. But we know God is perfect. We know he is the perfect being. Leviticus 11 and 45 says, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now, I don't know where perfection, but I believe holy is perfection. I believe being holy, hallelujah, just like God is, that's perfection. 1 Peter 1 and 15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Psalms 18 and 30 says, And as for God, his way is perfect. There it is in the word. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Again, Matthew 5 and 48 says, But ye therefore are perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. 
And then the last supporting scripture, Romans 3 and 4 says, God forbid, yet let God be truth, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So how these are proof in the word of God that he is a perfect being. I'm going to pause. Any questions? Any comments? I'd like us to look at when you, you went kind of fast through that, that part of us being made in his image and showing how we know that God is three in one when we are made to reflect the triune um, composite. And you uh, spoke of that. If, if you can reiterate that, I appreciate that. Because uh, uh, it is explicit to why we have a foundational and uh, permanent belief in the Trinity, because he said in our image, and therefore we have the tripart as well. Yes. Right. So you said something, and I didn't uh, catch it, but when you talked about um, ours in reflection to man and uh, in uh, comparison to God. And when he said, let us make man in our image, and you made a statement there that could have used a little bit more emphasis when it talks about okay. why, because we want to understand that we are in his image. That's why we have the try in us. Yes. So just to go a little bit deeper into that. So God is, you, he is a part of the Trinity. You have God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. So he's of, of three parts, God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. Then man is called triune. We're made of three parts. We are made up of our flesh, we're made up of our spirit, and we're made up of a soul. So we are triune as well. So those three parts connect and fit with God being made into his image. In other words, intellect, emotion, and will. We have those same uh, characters that God has in the same um, ordinance and same his design and plan. We have that same type of triune or trinity as God has. That again, in intellect, emotion, and will. As we say, intellect, our soul, and our spirit. Made up just like God is made up of three and one. And we're made up of three and one. Okay. Is that clear? And I'll slow down. <laughs> the pardon to the teacher. And while we're studying this, remember, we're establishing the foundation of our faith by understanding why we believe God exists. Yes. And so the searching and the researching of others' belief is, is causing them to be disqualified and thereby, valid, thereby validating and qualifying our truth that we believe in. So we need to keep our perspective because as we walk through the curriculum, it gets a little bit um, more in the detail and information, but we're re realizing that what we're doing is solidifying our faith by making sure you're sure that God exists yes. because he that believeth must first believe that he, he is. is. Yes. And so we're establishing those principles of faith. We're still studying faith, but we're looking at the other God. So we, as we teach this, we're running now with the curriculum. We have to keep bringing in the perspective that this is why we're looking at this. Yes. So you don't have to waver when someone asks you or questions you about your faith. Yes, yes, yes. And so that, if you've been a part of the series, that great faith that we have. Yes, we, our faith we establish and we're standing that God does exist and that we know in our faith that he does. And that's a part of our, you know, our faith and trust and standing on those building blocks that we did discuss. So then the, our, our next thing we're going into is the theological, which is the, uh, which is the argument from the scriptures or our proof in the scriptures, knowing that in our faith that God does exist. Here, and it says that, do you believe that God is, in fact, a reliable historical source? And we know that he is. Second Timothy 3 and 16 also proves that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. So our faith in God shows that um, the scriptures that are written are by God. The scriptures that are written are inspirations of God. And it also, it has profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instructions and righteousness. Um, do, you be, do you believe that the Bible is? Yes, I do. I believe it for myself. I've had my own personal experience that the promises of God have been fulfilled. Yes and amen to me. So I have my own personal experience in knowing that, yes, in faith, God, I know he's real. I know he's real because when God, when there's a promise spoken in the word of God, it has come to pass. I can personally say it for myself. So, yes, in my own personal experience, I say that the promises that have been given have been fulfilled in my life. And why do we believe this? Um, again, one of the greatest tools and proof that uh, God is real and exists is the prophetics that have been fulfilled. If you look at the times right now, and if you read in the book of Revelations, we are about parallel of what is going on in the book of Revelations. Time and time and time again, through the prophets of the Bible, it has come to pass. When the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus was going to come, Jesus was going to be a son, the son of God, he was going to die, and, be, and, and, and for the forgiveness of our sins, it was proof. It was spoken in the Old Testament, and it did come to pass. So the prophetic word of God has come to pass, which is another uh, instance of proof that God is real and he exists and the Bible is real. And then our faith and trust and foundation is on the word of God. So that's another strong argument that says, yes, we know that God does exist. I'm going to pause. Those of us who have the student book, you're following with her. So uh, let's talk about how the study manual works. The student book has the lines. So as you're listening to her, she's giving you the answers on the line. And so as she announced, for instance, the theological argument, you see that place? That's where you're starting to put your notes of what she's saying. So she's giving you the scriptural background to support it. So this is an active study manual. And so, but she kind of gave you the list. So you can look from the list if she said it too fast. So your notes has the list of the scriptures that she gave out for you. So if you miss it, she's giving you the scriptural support that should be now written on the line. So I see some of you uh, searching for where you're going. So all the information that she's speaking, they have none of that, lady, oh, okay. sister teacher. Okay. Um, <laughs> so they're uh, needing to follow. So I gave you, do you have your student book? I do. You? So you can following. kind of, if you could pause and go back and tell them where they can fill in those blanks as you've gone through your scriptures or you can ask them since they have the list which scripture would you put here to prove this point okay. and that way so um i was i didn't pull up my man, my teacher manual so I, d I didn't follow you either okay. but i'm watching the response so that's how it goes everybody's understanding so it's an <laughs> active manual it doesn't have all the information she's giving you so it's listening and engaging the information so one of the great question points will be if you miss the line, you don't know where that answer is, that could be a question that could go to uh, the mic for her to say. Uh, le uh, sister teacher on page nine, under anthropological argument, I missed the answer for there seems to be a blank of God. So that's how you do it. But okay. the, uh, the uh, express task is that you fill in it from the teacher's information because many of them will not stop to answer you. So following closely, using the notes, and then listening. She's keying in where you're looking for that. So the object is that you're writing in the information. Okay. And I wanted to explain because I see people stumbling. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to backtrack then. I'm going to back, back, back up. <laughs> I'm going to back up. So let's start with the cosmological argument. Um, backing up to cosmo the cosmological argument from... Do you remember what we talked about there? Cause and effect, yes, yes. So there in that blank um, area, you should have cause and effect. So I'll pause and give you a moment to write that in. Yes. Yes, when I, when I go across, I'm going to go down the line, and when I go back, I'll, I'll go back and explain that. Yes, 
Ajá. So again, that cosmological argument is from cause and effect. And then the supporting scriptures I had listed uh, was Genesis 1, chapter 1, then it was verse 3, verse 6, and verse 9. And in that student book, as you're writing, it says every effect has a corresponding cause. An effect as big as the universe must have a cause much greater than itself. And I did the demonstration of the dominoes, where um, and then explain the cause was when J when God spoke, let there be light. There was light, and so those are the supporting scriptures. So let me know when you guys are ready to move on. You guys, ready? Okay, so then the next one was teleological argument. And it says tele teleological argument from design. Yes, it was from design. And so I, uh, again, gave you examples of the patterns in nature. Um, the form and the found, um, found in the nature of the world, those patterns, I've described the leopard and the tree stump and the leaf and the snowflake and the orderliness of the day and night and the seasons. So um, yes, teleological argument is from design. And then that supporting scripture was coming from Genesis chapter one, and that's verse 12. And then verse 14 is a supporting scripture. Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. Ready? Okay. So let's go to the next. So the anthropological argument is from I'm going to say that again. Yes, from God's from his image. We're made in the likeness of God. And so the fir first bullet point says there seems to be a, a universal idea of God. So we have a universal idea of God. And again, that says even in the most remote regions, people have a sense to worship something uh, greater than themselves. So there's a universal um, idea of God. And then, um, very good, yes. The next one is men have a moral consciousness. A moral consciousness having that sense of what's right and what's wrong, okay? Okay. Okay, okay. 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 <laughs> and that's how I'm going so quickly. <laughs> Not a problem. I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, let's see, that's a logical argument. Okay. 
So I'll start with the next one. Or I'll go ahead and give you that answer to the last one. Men are personal beings. They have intellect, emotion, and will. Okay, and so I'm going to pause there because of just like God is, um, God is the, the Trinity. He is, uh, you have the Trinity, which is Father, God the Father, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. And then men are, tri it's called triune. We're made up of three parts as well. We have a, a, a body, a soul, and a spirit, or emotion, will, and intellect. So we're, we're made up. They wanted me to go back for that, too. We're made up just like God is made up. So we are definitely made in his image. And men are called triune. Is that clear? Yes. Which is um, like there's a clone of emotion, intellect, and will. Yes. Yes. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So when you do hear it, you should see parallel words. So people just use different words for the same meaning. Same meaning, yes. So it's the same meaning. So people have the, when they explain the triune, it will sometimes become the intellect, emotion, and will. And then some that some are reflected directly to the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, so that authoritative is our intellect, where we're able to manipulate and do things with our mind, right? And then the That's Spirit correct. of God is our spirit, like our spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. And then the son, uh, which is working with his will to give up his life. So we have that same will to give our life to, fa to God. So the reflection perspective often, often will reflect the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then the natural reflection will be our intellect, emotion, and will. So they're really the same, but they're um, sometimes identified in a different parallel. So a lot of times, if you look up the definitions, you'll see they're relating to the same thing. Yes. No, I just want to make sure you're good. OK. Yes. yes, and that's exactly the yeah. same thing. Yeah, it's yes. the same thing, yes. Yeah, so you're saying the same thing. People use different words. Say yours again. Word spirit. Right, it's the same thing. So it's the presentation and the perspective, but it's the parallels that they use. So you're saying exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, I, and be, I heard it the different ways, too. I've heard it that way as well. But if you look at what it's referring to, it's exactly the same concepts, right? We're in the flesh, uh -huh. right? And we, are, we have our spirit man. The Bible refers to it as our inner man, yes. right? And our soul, that's what needs to be saved. That's what's going to have the eternal thing of God, right? That's correct. Same. Yeah. Uh, so everybody yeah. got it? Because I know as you go forth, you do hear it in different ways. Right. But what you do is look at the meanings of the words, and then you can line up the perspective. That's it, yes. And I'm definitely going to do that, too. Because <laughs> I'm going to put that on the review, so it'll be parallel, and you'll see the, the, that clearness. So I'm going to definitely in, in include that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. So then we'll go back to reviewing the ontological argument, which is this argument says because man has an idea of God being absolutely perfect. Um, and then I have those as supporting scriptures that be ye holy for I am holy. And then also Matthew 5 and 48 says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So that's what we're striving for. That's what we're striving for. Then um, let's see. So you guys understand what the analogical argument for the man's idea of an absolute perfect being would be the answer, just a perfect being. Okay. And then the theological argument, um, this is again uh, the proof of scripture. 
It says that because we have a reliable history of the Bible that tells us that God exists. We re definitely rely on the word of God. Um, so the theologian argument is from scripture. That would be that scripture. And there, uh, the word of God is just sure that we stand on. Again, 2 Timothy 3 and 16 supports it all and says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. And then our own personal testimonies. I'm sure everybody has a personal testimony <laughs> that God has fulfilled a promise. If you're a Christian, you know that God has for sure have fulfilled a promise. He has, uh, yes, yes, he has fulfilled his promise. So you know that he's real and you know that the scripture is right. And then the prophetic, if you s have studied, you study the Old Testament, how it prophesied Jesus was coming and the different prophetic things that have come to pass. And if you look at Revelations, we're in parallel to Revelations. The things that have been spoken in Revelations is coming to pass right now. So we know that, that the word of God, again, is real and is true. So then I had some support, some poor scriptures for that as well. It says, what does the Bible teach about whether or God um, he exists? And there's so many scriptures, <laughs> so many scriptures, but I'll just read a few. Psalms 19 and 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Numbers 23 and 19, another supporting scripture, says that God is not a man that he should lie, uh, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall it not make it good? So we know that God doesn't lie. What he's spoken is real and true. Deuteronomy 4 and 35 says, unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. That's a strong, solid scripture that says beside him, there is none other. So the Lord, he is God. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 and 39 says, now, therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. So you just read scripture after scripture that shows that God exists. He's constantly proving himself in his own word. He's proving himself in his word. So I just want to pause. Any comments or questions? We want to try to tie in our internet family. So we're going to go ahead and repeat those scriptures for you because I know you do not have the notes. Uh, but uh, 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 Evangelist Arlette, if you could start from Psalms 18 and just call off those scriptures because... Um, in-house we're looking at it but on the internet um uh, they don't have the book to okay, refer to, to. Refer to okay. and so we have completed or walked through um um part of this unit which is stopped we're right now at page nine and we're looking at the different comparatives of ideas about god's existence and now we're going to give the list of our supporting scriptures so for your ability to write them down um Evangelist Jefferson will review them just running through the list. Okay, so for that, for the theological argument, the supporting scriptures are Psalms 19 and 7. Psalms 19 and 7. And uh, the next one is Numbers 23 and 19. Yes. Yes, that is correct. It is, thank you, uh, Deacon Joe. It's Psalms 19, 7 through 9. Sorry about that. Yes. Psalms 19, 7 through 9. Again, Numbers 23 and 19. 
Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verse 35. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. And then the next is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. So that's 35 and 39. And then Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 9. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 9. And that, I didn't read that one, but I can read that. Now, where therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So here are supporting scriptures that God is God. And this was just a handful. I couldn't, I, there was no way it would take all class and more. <laughs> if I went through all the scriptures that supported that God exists and that he constantly speaks of himself, it would have taken all, you know. So these I thought just really stood out and they, they stood out to me. And I really wanted to show that this, these are our supporting scriptures. Okay, so we're going to go to the very last. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. And so I had a couple, uh, two more. Um, so this, uh, I wanted to present this question. So what if someone refuses to believe that the Bible is God's word? Because you got some that don't believe, some that will dispute, some that will argue with you and don't believe. Matthew 10 and 14 tells us, and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your word, when ye depart out of that house or city, what did we learn in Matthews? Shake the dust off your feet. <laughs> you just got to keep going. Psalms, uh, and that's, that's Matthews 10 and 14. Matthews 10 and 14. And then Psalms 14 and 1 says, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, and there is none that doeth good. So you just pray and just keep going. That's what you got to do. And again, that's Psalms 14 and 1. So the last um, supporting uh, argument that we have that God exists is practical argument, just practical um, this argument is called the practical argument because it says that of all the views of God we have studied, theism is one of the best fits and facts. God is, uh, they described it as metaphysical, so God is a spirit. And there's no way you can have scientific proof of, of a spirit. Um, these are arguments can be helpful in supplying logical reasons for faith in the existence of God. And although human reason is a gift from God, it alone is not sufficient. For us to know God as he really is, it is absolutely essential that he chooses to reveal himself to us, and he does through his word. He makes a choice to reveal himself. He's in, in the word of God, he's revealed himself. So I'm thankful that he has done that. just that. Um, how do we know? One, indirectly through his creation. We know that God exists, that an intelligent being created the heavens and the earth based on the patterns. Directly through his word, we know that in his word, we absolutely know that when it's talking about God, it's God in heaven, and it's through his word, and personally through his son that he sent, Jesus Christ. We know that um, through just the practical argument that because Jesus came and died on the cross for us, we know that God exists. I'll pause. Any questions, comments? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll backtrack. Okay, so with the practice, to emphasize, well, what it is is that in we know that indirectly through his creation, we know that God exists because of creation, because of what we describe, the heaven and earth, because of the patterns, um, the orderliness of, of the earth, we know that God exists. And we do through his word. 
studying his word, our relationship, in our prayer, and in our faith, our faith, we know that God exists because we stand on the word of God. And it's an absolute understood that God's word speaks of him. He is God. He is God. And then for him just sending his only begotten son, we know that that is proof. He sent his son to forgive our sins and make us, have us, gives us the ability to have a way uh, to make it to heaven. So we know through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us, we know that God exists. God exists. So if you can turn to page 10, and would love your participation, <laughs> would love your participation. Page 10 is just our practical or our life application. And they're just, it's a basic, some basic uh, statements and would like for you to fulfill the uh, statements in the book. It says that the Bible, fill in the blank, God's existence. Yes. The Bible, if you look at page 10 at the top, it's fill in the blank. You need to fill in the blank. So what do you think the word is? The, the Bible, fill in the blank, God's existence. Proves, supports assumes or it's an understood you know how you know it's understood it's understood that God exists in the Bible it's understood we know that he's talking about God okay the next one says God says that the man who says there is no God is a what a fool <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> well, the man that says there is no God is a fool, and that's found in Psalm 14 and 1. So we were just talking about this. God has, fill in the blank, himself plainly to man, but man has suppressed and rejected that knowledge. That's exactly it. God has revealed himself plainly to man he has revealed himself plainly to man but man has suppressed and rejected that knowledge and then the very last says since there is a god we should seek to do what since there is a god we should seek to Serve him, yes. Obey's a good one. Worship, yes. I like those, serve, worship, obey. Know him, yes. I like that. We seek to know him, worship him, serve him, and obey him. Yes. All of these we should. We should seek his face. The scripture tells us to seek his face. And just to worship, we were designed to worship God. He made us to worship and to serve him. Okay. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper. Um, I have a separate sheet that um, has the Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And we're going to read the selective uh, verses, and then I want you to uh, fill in a blank. It's going to be interactive as we go. So follow with me. I'll read the first verse, chapter 8, and then um, we're going to read what's in the book and fill in the blank. Yeah, verses, it's Romans chapter 1, verses 18, um, and then it's through 32. Verses 18 through 32. So, 
Um, the very first chapter, 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So in that verse, it says, Man who hold down or suppress the truth God has revealed about himself are described as what? Ungodly, yes. They're described as <laughs> ungodly and unrighteous. Yes, very good. <laughs> okay, and then um, I'm going to read down to the 20th. It says, because that, but because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So it reads, the things that are clearly seen by men are God's invisible qualities, such as his, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, 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 you guys got it. <laughs> All right, so then verse uh, 21 says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but because futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So it says, when men, I'm sorry, although men knew these facts about God, they refused to glorify God or give thanks to him. Very good. Okay, we're going down to the 22nd verse. Prophes professing to be wise, they became fools. So when, <laughs> when men rejected God's elevation of himself, they thought that they were being wise yes they thought they were being wise when actually they were showing themselves to be foolish exactly then verse 23 reads and change the glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things so it says, ungodly men exchange God's glory for anybody know? Almost. Almost. Image. Yes. So it says, ungodly men exchange God's glory for image made like various kinds of animals. So, uh, Co Pastor Bella, you're right. It was right on that line because <laughs> you said <laughs> idols. Yes, that's what Co Pastor said. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so then uh, verse 24 says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And so it says, because men rejected God's revelation of himself, revelation of himself, excuse me, God gave them up to, yes, uncleanness, impurity. Okay, then the 25th verse says, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creation rather or the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So then 1 and 25 says, when men rejected God, they get things turned upside down, and so they choose to worship the Creature instead of the creator. That is so true. OK, 
okay? And then um, verse 26 says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. So next, God gave men up to foul passion, yeah, immoral desires. Got a couple more, I'll pick it up here. Um, then it says, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving uh, in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God as their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased, or the, it's in the, this is the New King James Version, and the King James Version is a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. So since they, so in 1 to 28 it says, since they did not re retain, yes, or acknowledge God, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. And then the last one, just reading down to that. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, and vitters of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So the last one says, sinful mankind is so far from God due to rejecting God's revelation of himself that even though he knows that death, yes, is the penalty for the, his sin, he still continues to commit sins himself and to have pleasure in others who practice sin. So we know it's very important to know the existence of God. This paints the picture that it is very important for us to know uh, the uh, existence of God. So in the conclusion of our lesson, I just want to just go over three, a uh, couple of points. It's beginning with Genesis 1 and 1. The Bible uh, ha gives an understanding that God exists rather than trying to offer classical proof of his existence. We know that God exists. In the Bible, when it talks about it, it talks about that God, and we know that it's understood that it is God. God says that man who says there is no God is a fool. And God has revealed himself plainly to men, but man has suppressed and rejected that knowledge because, because of its spiritual and moral implication. And that, again, was found in Romans 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. The problem is not that there is not enough evidence for the existence of God. Uh, the problem is that sinful men, won't, they reject the evidence. And since we know that there is a God, it is of supreme importance that we get to know God and seek to worship and serve him. Um, and so as we continue to study the word, you'll under, it'll emphasize in the next five lessons that it's important that we get to know who God is that we have our own personal relationship with God, which builds our faith. We talked about the building blocks of faith, and we have to have that important relationship with God. That we, have. we talked about for every measure of faith, uh, every person is given a measure of faith, and we went through the building blocks up to great faith. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So as we continue to know, we know that God exists. And this is just uh, the beginning of the lesson. But we're going to dive deep into why we have to strengthen and have the building blocks of our faith. So that concludes uh, lesson one. If we could just stand, we'll have a word of prayer.